and welcome to True Crime with me, Emma Kelly. It is my 100th episode. It is my centenary. Can you believe I've been doing this enough time to have made 100 episodes? And you chose the episode that I'm going to cover today, which is going to be on Ted Bundy or Theodore Robert Cowell, who became later known as Ted Bundy. When you asked me to do this and I put it out to a vote and it came back, I was a little bit worried because I know that you have consumed probably every documentary that's ever been out there on Ted Bundy. You've probably read loads of books, you have your own opinions. And my thing on this channel is always, how do I give you some added value? So 30 pages of research that I've written since that moment in time has led me to know that probably there is a lot you don't know about this particular individual. I'm sure some of you will, but for the most part, I think a lot of us take the information that we're given from documentaries and books. And actually, ironically, there's often more that needs collating. And what I've tried to do is to bring elements from all the different avenues, from court reports, through to books, through to chronology, through to some of the more, shall we say, Hollywood glamorized context that this case has covered. and submerge myself into that and collate it in a way that hopefully will introduce you to facts that you didn't know. Certainly there were a lot of facts that I didn't know and I tend to think that I'm quite well read, particularly on serial killers, but you can let me know. I've also not gone into like real gore. I do cover the killings. Obviously it's important to do that for context, but I don't go into any major detail about that because basically I don't think that's the part that's interesting we know that he killed people and he murdered innocent victims and their legacy should be known for all of us because their lives had infinite meaning but I don't think going into the grotesque detail is probably going to be that helpful I kind of do go past it so to speak and give you the minimal details involved but for the most part I'm just really interested in the psychology what formed him and like I said introducing you hopefully to a few things that you weren't aware of. Before I start, I just want to give a big shout out to say thank you for getting me to the level that I'm at now. The subscriptions that I've got blow my mind and the fact that you return and view my content is really, really important to me. And as it's my 100th ep, I just want to say thank you so much for all your support. You have changed my life for the better. And it's a really lovely position to be in to be able to extend that thanks to you. A lot of people probably underestimate the kind of impact that they have on other people's lives, but you guys have had a major impact on my life and I really appreciate it. So hopefully I'm going to do you proud with the most requested video that I've ever had. For those of you who actually don't know me and have just stumbled on my channel, I release content on a Wednesday and a Sunday religiously. It's always deep dives. So if you know the case, you probably won't know the information that I'm gonna tell you. If you haven't joined me for a live chat, please do. My premieres go out at the same time every week, which means that I can get involved. As I always say, thanks to my Patreon subs as well. You're making a huge difference to my content creation. That said, Let's get in to probably the longest video I'm going to do. It may not be. I've done some pretty epic length videos, but this one genuinely feels from a research perspective that it is going to be my longest. Maybe I will be wrong. Maybe you will come back at the end and be like, Emma, you overestimated that. Let's see. As I said, we're going to be covering Ted Bundy or Theodore Robert Cowell, who was later known as Ted Bundy. He is known the world over for all the wrong reasons. And I would say that probably he is represented as the poster boy of serial killers. He gained a really glamorous reputation. This is why he's had the Hollywood treatment, so to speak, the celebrity treatment, so to speak. But nonetheless, we have to remember throughout the conversation that I'm going to have with you today, this man is responsible for a heinous amount of murders in the most brutal of ways. So keep that in mind, because whilst I'm going to cover all aspects of who he is and who he was, the reality is that we've never got to lose sight of the fact that he's genuinely one of the most dangerous human predators that has potentially ever existed, at least in modern times. Now, you will have probably seen a lot of films 
about Ted Bundy. He's been portrayed in many different ways. His exploits, as I said, have had the Hollywood treatment. And because of this, it feels like over the years, the truth of the crimes that he committed have somewhat been diluted because there's been this romanticized image of him. And because of that, realistically and tragically, in fact, Bundy's name lives on. But the names of all of his victims, they're mostly forgotten. These people who essentially are the most important in this narrative, they tend to become anonymous to some degree because nobody's thinking of the names of those individuals. They just become a body count, which is just horrible because they are the individuals who were denied legacy. You know, for all the families, all the friends who love them, that's a tragedy in itself. Every single one of the women and girls that Ted Bundy murders, they all had hopes, they all had dreams of a future. They genuinely all had their lives ahead of them and they were bright lives. Ted Bundy took those glittering potential futures away. Why? He wanted to simply satisfy his warped and his perverted desires. Now, another thing that really gets me about Ted Bundy is that somehow, and I do mean somehow, he managed to gain this reputation as a good-looking, charming, near-genius, boy-next-door type character. And that's how I would summarise the way that he's being portrayed. But this could not be further from the truth. Ted Bundy wasn't a attractive boy next door clever guy. He was a cold blooded monster. He was a thief. He was a rapist. He was a murderer. He was a paedophile child molester. He was a necrophiliac and he was a conman. Hardly attractive boy next door qualities. You know, he is the last person in the whole universe that should ever have been idolized in any way, shape or form. Because to use a psychological term to describe this man, he was an utter and complete asshole. I know, it's not the normal and typical language that we would use to describe an individual, but I don't care because this man deserves that title and a whole heap more. Now, as I said at the very beginning, the job and duty of me today is not to just do the usual follow a step-by-step -step chronological account of his life and crimes. There's going to be some things that I need to do in order, of course it is, but it's been done a billion times and I don't want to just give you the same that has been given out by other channels and documentaries and books, not that there's anything wrong with that. But because you've come here, hopefully, to gain some more insight or different insight, I'm going to do it, hopefully, a little bit differently. So what I'm going to do is focus on Bundy's psychology. I'm also going to look at the type of killer that he was, because that's really important. It is a very intriguing exploration when you start digging deep into the psyche. Because I think that we don't necessarily have a rounded understanding of what formed him, who he was. And certainly when I've heard his interviews and over the years I've watched every single Bundy interview that has ever been done, both those that were recorded in video form, but also those that were taped, because that's really important that you kind of get to hear the narrative as told by the killer. But also because I'm interested in pathological liars and Ted Bundy tends to fit that category very nicely. And the story that he tells and brings out about his family tends to be this swallows and Amazons. Yes, it was a religious household and yes, there were really strong boundaries, but with respect, it was a wonderful life and so on and so forth. They had no impact on the person that I began and became. So Ted Bundy would constantly tell people that there was no reason that his childhood had had an impact on his behavior. And I think it's really easy when you have a first person narrative to just buy into that. But the thing about any psychopathic serial killer is you can't actually believe what they say a lot of the time because they just don't know how to tell the truth. So we have to actually look historically at the aspects of his upbringing and also other people's perspectives on that to gauge how truthful Ted was about describing what actually happened to him. So I suppose the most unusual aspect of his childhood was his parentage, because when he was a teenager, he discovered that his parents, as he knew them, were in fact his biological maternal grandparents. So he was being brought up 
with this couple who he genuinely believed were his blood parents and it turned out that was just a lie. So his oldest sister was actually his mother, that's Eleanor Louise Cowell. And she'd given birth to Bundy when she was 22 years of age. She actually did that in a home for unwed mothers. That's important as well because she was 22 and she was sent to a home for unwed mothers. Because of illegitimacy, where children were concerned, there was a whole amount of shame associated with particular families and their belief systems would often collude with that. So whilst many people had illegitimate children and many children were brought into families who were loving and who accepted the fact that although it wasn't ideal, a woman had got pregnant and had a birth out of wedlock, for certain families, particularly very religious families, it was just a clear no-no. So if you got pregnant, you were sent away at best at times to a home for unwed mothers. At worst, you were put in infirmaries and given mental health orders where you would literally often serve the rest of your life in a mental health institute because you had literally got pregnant out of wedlock. We know that this is a heinous representation of where our society used to be and it's changed, thank God. But nonetheless, this was the state of play for a lot of women. The fact that she was 22 and in a facility like a home for unwed mothers meant that we automatically know that her pregnancy was not accepted by her family, at least in the first instance, because she was sent away. However, this was probably to do with the fact that Bundy's family actually did want potentially to keep him, but didn't want the people in the surrounding area to know that it was that he was a product of illegitimacy. So once Bundy was born, his mother then returned to his family, who'd obviously wanted to avoid all the shame and social stigma. And at this point, his grandparents, Eleanor and Samuel Cowell, decided that they would bring him up as their child. So the way to deal with the fact that their daughter was pregnant was to lie about the fact that she was pregnant and instead suggest that the whole family buy into this narrative that somehow they were the parents. It's interesting how families work, isn't it? That there is this sense of shame about an individual's actions and the family don't wanna confront that. So the way that they manage that is to create an even bigger story that has even more problems associated with it. In this case, pretending that Ted Bundy belonged directly to Eleanor and Samuel, as opposed to just acknowledging the shame and bringing him up with his birth mother. Bundy was never told of this. They were never informing him of the fact that he wasn't actually their biological son. He just believed that he was a late baby in his own words. And he spent the first three years of his life living in his maternal grandparents' home. Now, according to some reports, he didn't find out the truth that he was Eleanor and Samuel's grandson until he was a teenager because he found his birth certificate at that point. But there are other reports that suggest that actually he found out because he was being teased by a cousin and that cousin was saying that he was illegitimate. But, I told you I was gonna bring in different reports, Later, he actually claimed that he basically always knew the truth because there was this vast age difference between himself and his sister and that she always acted essentially as a primary caregiver towards him. So he felt looked after by her. He felt that she was much more of a mother figure in that context and her parents, his apparent parents, the age gap felt so big for him that it made sense that she was actually his mother. And he said that she did look after him relatively well. Now, whether this is true or not, we're not gonna know, because like I said, he isn't the biggest truth teller. And what he says in interviews and in written word is that it didn't have an impact on him, that he found out the truth and essentially he was okay with it. Now, I would be absolutely flabbergasted if that were the truth, just on a psychological level. The thing about being lied to by your primary caregivers is it makes the world feel unsafe. Listen, one of the reasons that we ensure that parents who adopt children tell those children from the minute they can communicate, from the very get-go, that they are adopted and special and chosen by them 
is so that they understand all through their life. There's no aha moment at 16 when you feel like your entire life has been built on lies. Instead, you feel very much embraced and not something to be ashamed of regarding your history. It's exactly the same with donor babies. So even when you as a mother get pregnant using a donor baby and essentially the child can see that you were the person carrying them, you're told from the very beginning to read them books about how a lovely lady gave you one of her eggs because you couldn't create them yourself and so on and so forth. And you embed in the child this knowledge that the way that they were conceived and brought up was so important to their story and to your story because without this story, they would never have come into your life. And it's so helpful psychologically, the impact of knowing your roots and being unashamed of them is so powerful. And the reason we know that is because we've seen what happens when people don't have their roots and find out that they're not who they believe that they were. It can be absolutely horrific impact wise on their psyche because you genuinely feel like you didn't know who you were and everything you were told was based on a lie. So for Ted Bundy to say, it wasn't a problem. Finding out that my sister was actually a mother was just something I accepted. It's probably less about him telling the truth and more about him wanting to shade us from the trauma that he experienced. Arguably, you could also say, well, as a psychopath, maybe he doesn't experience pain in the same way as everybody else. So emotionally, it didn't cut him as deeply as it would an ordinary well-adjusted human being. I agree with that, but that doesn't mean it does not trigger and change the way an individual reacts and responds to certain things, stimulus or people or gender. And I think that's something really important that we acknowledge. And I guess that the thing that we could at this point question is did this potentially help him form a deep resentment of his mother? So did this start a potential hatred of women in general? Could this have been the trigger? Because apparently he did become obsessed with the fact that he was illegitimate. And one of the sad things for Ted Bundy is that during that period of becoming quite obsessed, understandably, he wanted to know who his father was. And unfortunately, he will never be known because it was never discussed in an open way. Nobody was able to directly tell him who his father was. There are suggestions that he was actually a child of incest. So the suggestions were that his grandfather was also his biological father. And what we do know about Samuel, in spite of the fact that Ted Bundy tended to be quite positive about his upbringing, was actually Samuel had a very violent temper. And his grandmother, again, she had some issues. She suffered from depression. She suffered from agoraphobia. So there were life-limiting issues. So this was not a lovely environment to be growing up in. It was complex. There would have been confusion. And obviously any child who has to deal with physical abuse is not going to be the happiest child possible because it makes you feel that your sense of self is being violated. It makes the world feel very vulnerable. And it makes home feel a place that can at times feel deeply unsafe. Also, there were suspicions that Bundy might have been abused by his grandfather. Now, he always denied this and he consistently claimed that they had a really good relationship. And I will tell you that in spite of the suspicion around Bundy's mother and grandfather, she always maintained the same story. She said that she had been seduced and she'd been abandoned by a war veteran. That was the story that she told. And again, I don't think that we need to suggest that she's lying. I mean, this is her narrative. This is her first person account. And time-wise, with respect, it could make sense that there was a war veteran that she got involved with and she got pregnant and he walked away. That said, ultimately we'll never know the truth but I'm just trying to tie in different elements and strands that will let you make your decisions about this. So one thing that I can definitely say that does stand out a little for Ted Bundy is that unlike most serial killers, Bundy didn't necessarily have a very disaffective or highly abusive childhood. I think we can agree on that. 
So in spite of the fact there may have been abuse and violence from the grandfather at times, it certainly wasn't prolific. And to some degree, we can also acknowledge that some disagree that it occurred. But it wasn't a simple childhood. We can all agree on that. So whilst those early years weren't absolutely perfect, there was clearly some security there. And his mother was a secretary. And by all accounts, his stepfather, who was Johnny Culpepper Bundy, who eventually obviously walked into his mother's life and became a father figure to him, he was a great dad. But Bundy really didn't respect him. And the reason that he didn't respect him was that he considered him working class and he considered him unintelligent. Bear in mind, Ted Bundy is somebody who has a high superiority complex and believes that he is far more intelligent than us mere mortals. And Johnny Culpepper Bundy did not fit the paradigm of possibility and positivity that Bundy desired because Bundy wanted opportunities given to him. And he felt that his stepfather could not provide him with the materialistic things that Bundy wanted and with respect felt that he deserved. Now, they would act like the all-American family in many ways. They all went to the church and Bundy got heavily involved with the church. He actually became the Methodist Youth Fellowship's vice president on one level. That's a really good thing. We want kids to get involved in their local community. But what else does it tell you? It tells you that even from an early age, he likes the idea of power and position, doesn't he? He likes people to validate him, admire him. And this seems to take place really early on in his psyche. And Bundy used to get involved in lots of kids clubs. He used to attend camps. And I imagine that was quite a lot of fun. But nonetheless, it would also mean that people knew who he was, even as a child. It is worth noting that this is said time and time again. He didn't fit in with other kids. And there were different reasons for this. Firstly, he felt different. And secondly, there were some differences and idiosyncrasies within his personality that meant that he didn't necessarily find it as easy to connect with people around him. And one of the things that was a real struggle for him early on was he had a really terrible speech impediment. And that was for a very long time. So there were many words that he couldn't pronounce. This meant that it was really difficult for other people to understand him. That creates a real problem with communication. Obviously, it can create deep insecurity. He got teased a hell of a lot because children are going to notice differences. And this is something that would have created a real blocker for him to form some real primary connections. And I think anybody who's had a lisp or a problem with stuttering or just something about who they are, like me, I suffer from neurological tics that I can kind of control relatively at times, but sometimes, particularly in stressful situations, they just go crazy. And so as soon as I say that, I start to do a tick. But nonetheless, it's something that makes you very aware when you're younger because you kind of see that people are looking at you strangely. And that's even with minor issues. So when you really have a problem where you can't express yourself because your words almost feel like the enemy, this is going to be really problematic. And Ted, Bundy had this issue. So just to acknowledge that's quite traumatizing, isn't it? And then being bullied, everyone knows, is super traumatizing per se. We also note that in his early years, he has a glaringly big red flag on the psychopathy scale because he really enjoyed hurting animals. Tick, there it is. Now, apparently, one of the animals that he went for a lot were frogs, I suppose, because they're easily accessible. He would apparently torture frogs, but he also, on one occasion, hung a stray cat and then he poured lighter fluid all over the cat who was attached to a clothesline and then he set that cat alight, which is beyond barbaric, isn't it? And again, it's introducing us to that mindset of wishing to control life and death. He was also known to play games with mice. So with the mice, what he would do is he would let some live and he would kill some. So that early indication, the thrill that he gets from power, from control and making choices 
over who lives and dies. It's a big part of that, isn't it? You've got these mice, eeny, meeny, miny, mo, and you choose which one's going to live and what's going to die. You have the ultimate control. Also, he used to take young kids into the woods and what he'd do was he'd strip them down and then he'd take their clothes. So think about that power dynamic and of course the introduction to potential sexual predilections that are going to stay with him through his life because he liked younger girls. In fact, he liked very young girls at points. So that alerting us when we look at that to this idea that there was more going on in that moment than just power and domination. The removing clothes is obviously humiliating for a child. It's definitely dominating and powerful, but it's also potentially sexually motivated, isn't it? One of his aunts, she awoke when he was three years old and she discovered that he'd put knives all around her body. Three years old. In fact, he did have a deep fascination of knives per se, developed in very early childhood. But can you imagine waking up to a three-year-old? I mean, at three years old, my kid was finding it difficult to break into a Dairy Lee Dunkers packet, not finding themselves adept at picking out all of the knives in the drawer and placing them round body of ants. Very, very odd behavior. And she actually felt quite perturbed by the fact that even though she clearly thought this is weird as hell, the rest of the family didn't seem to find it very disturbing. Again, I acknowledge that a lot of us as children had bizarre habits and often those habits are completely forgivable, totally to do with childhood and not something that becomes problematic in the long term. However, I would suggest, should your child be distributing sharp knives around your body in bed under five, it's probably worth having a chat with your primary care provider just have a word on the off chance that they may turn one day into a horrific serial killer that you would have noted could have had some help early on if you'd recognised the alarm bells. Now, whether it was nature or nurture or a combination of the two, when we look at what formed Bundy, what we absolutely know about him when we look at the childhood, when we talk about the potential ingredients, when we explore the man that he was becoming, the absolute thing we are completely aware of is that Bundy would go on to become one of the US's most prolific serial killers, probably one of the world's most prolific serial killers. And the sad thing about this case is the fact that I'm gonna talk about certain murders, but no one really knows how many Ted Bundy managed to kill. He admitted to around 30, but others who are well educated in this field and genuinely have a grasp on what they expect when looking at an individual's profile and behavior, that actually he probably killed possibly over a hundred. And many of those disappeared without trace. In fact, many of his victims per se, who he admitted to had disappeared without trace. Now, one of the reasons that he was so prolific is due to the type of killer that he was. He was an organized serial killer, which is a nightmare for investigators because the clue is in the name. They're really organized. Also, Ted Bundy was very intelligent. He was bright and he was well above average intelligence, but he wasn't a genius. A lot of people suggest he was a genius. He wasn't, he was just bright. So the reports of his IQ differ I actually thought it was a different level. I thought it was about 130, but actually the agreed on is that he had an IQ of 124. So still, you know, 24 over average, it's a high IQ. He was also organized because he understood police procedure very well. So he left very minimal forensic evidence at the scenes. In fact, they have never found any fingerprints, any, on any of his victims or any crime scenes indeed, so no fingerprints were ever left. I will say that in spite of the fact that he was very organized, we also have to acknowledge that it was during a particular time frame. You know, he was helped to some degree because he offended in the days before DNA profiling. He, if he had committed some of the crimes today, 
that he committed, or even some of the crimes that he committed a decade later, he would have been caught much more quickly. One of the things that Ted Bundy did, a bit like Israel Keyes, is he killed over large geographical areas, so he killed over seven states. The killings were planned meticulously. I mean, Ted Bundy would go out of his way to thoroughly research the areas, so he would first off scope where he was going to carry out the crimes. He would scope out the safe places that he could actually take and then kill his victims. And also, chillingly, he would scope out the places he could leave their bodies, basically with the least likelihood of them being found. Also, I will acknowledge that he was helped by police incompetence because it took a hell of a long time for police authorities in different states to realise the crimes were linked and that they were actually hunting the same person. I will, in their defence, also note that they didn't even have fax machines at the time, they didn't have the internet, they didn't have mobile phone technology, so everything was just dial phones and hopefully people sharing information, but this meant that Ted Bundy could be one step ahead a lot of the time. You just think nowadays an email takes a second and you can pick a phone up anywhere in the world and just call somebody in a different department and this is how linking occurs and that's before we go into the DNA and evidence that is collected that way forensically. So the police had it up against them but there was also some incompetence without a doubt and because of that it meant that linking the crimes just didn't happen for a huge amount of time. In fact it didn't really happen until he was apprehended, simple as that. So stereotypically as we would imagine for an organised serial killer he would usually abduct the victim in one location, he'd kill them in another, and then he would dispose of the body in yet another location. He also used what we would call a silent method to incapacitate them. So he would use blunt force trauma. This was usually with a crowbar. That obviously renders the victim completely helpless. They're not gonna be able to scream for help. Most of them wouldn't even have known what was coming. It would just be you were in a conversation or maybe you were starting to get afraid but you hadn't got to a point of screaming out and by that point he just rendered you unconscious. Then he would strangle his victim which meant that there wasn't any noise and there wasn't any ballistic evidence from the gun. So this is why it's known as that silent form. Bundy, in my research, and certainly I think from the general public's consensus, is he was driven by just homicidal fantasies. They were obsessive homicidal fantasies. And the problem with obsessive homicidal fantasies is you spend a lot of time dreaming them up. So a little bit like if you were directing a movie and you were to tell somebody about the fact that you want to direct a movie and then they said, well, I'm going to go and direct that for you and they get the wrong cast. Or the way that somebody acts isn't how you've written the script. So the problem with that is it doesn't play out in reality as the fantasy has been drafted. And with obsessive homicidal fantasies, this is a problem for Ted Bundy because he's trying to perfect the absolute perfect kill. And as I always say in my videos, one of the big problems that we have as human beings for these kills is we are unpredictable. It is our unpredictability that makes us amazing and inventive and curious and inquisitive, but it also makes us victims who don't act how they may want us to act in their heads when we are brought into their reality. And this meant the reality of the kill just failed to meet the stimulation which was provided by the prospect of the kill. So it was uh, thinking of it, playing it out, drawing it out in his head. That's what he wanted to accomplish in reality. So then when he actually acts out a killing, it's not reaching that standard. And this is what compels him to continue killing. It's this desire to achieve the unobtainable, the perfect kill. So the imagined high of his fantasies are what continued to drive him to go on and to kill again and again. Now, many people consider Bundy to be a lust killer, and I myself definitely believe that Ted Bundy was a lust killer, and the reason for that is that he raped his victims, and he also engaged in sexual activity with their corpses, 
And the manner of the way he kills does seem to support this contention with respect because typically as the lust murderer kills more people the time between the killings tends to decrease and the brutality and the violence of the killings tend to increase and this was certainly the case with Ted Bundy however on doing this research it does turn out that sex was not his main motivation and I've rethought what his classification would be. And it's that Bundy was a power control serial killer. The sexual satisfaction that he really gained was from the power that he held over his victims. So the sexual assault was obviously present, but it was a way of further dominating his victims. So he basically got off on the sense of power that he felt over the helplessness that his victims were experiencing. That's the kind of killer he was. And he actually later stated, and it is just, oh. And I've heard similar said by other killers, but there's something about Ted Bundy that really gets me to my core when I think about his words. He said, you feel the last bit of breath leaving their body. You're looking into their eyes. A person in that situation is God. No, Ted. A person in that situation is a sex offending murderer, with respect. But just my opinion, Ted, you know, don't think you're God. Not sure God is responsible for raping and murdering children for a start, but you can see, can't you, that power, domination, that drunk on the desire to be the person that snuffs out the life. So I've really rethought my interpretation of these crimes and his crimes were all about power. They were all about possession too. And the reason that I bring that in is it is quite astounding that when you look at Ted Bundy's history, his offending, who he was, virtually everything he owned, he'd stolen. And I mean that, virtually everything that he had in his possession, he'd stolen from other people. Something about enjoying possessing it. And it's like he transferred that same desire to just own things they'd taken. And the same applied to his victims, you know, he possessed them. You know, he did this by feeling that he had a right to sexually abuse their bodies. Then he went on to take their lives. And okay, initially he did this to dispose of the evidence and witness, but later it grew and he did it as the ultimate form of possession because he believed that he became one with the victim. He felt that when he took a body and left a body in a particular place, that that ground became sacred to him. And he would be drawn back to it again and again. And he even kept the remains after death. And he would go back and he would engage in necrophilia. And when I talk about necrophilia, I'm not talking about in the moments after the death or even the day after, the two days after the death. I'm talking about him revisiting corpses and indulging in those sexual activities with them until their bodies were completely decayed, where putrefaction and animal predation had made it so impossible for him to have sex with them anymore that he had to stop. Until that point, he was going back. And he would also groom the corpses, so he would put makeup on them, he would shampoo their hair, he would dress them up. As I've said, he got engaged in sexual post-mortem activity. This was possession too. You know, he's perpetuating that sense of control that he has over his victims. The fact that he could go back whenever he wanted and nobody else knew that he could violate them whenever he wished. He could make them look however he wanted. And also, I think we can all agree that it meant that he avoided any chance of rejection because a dead body cannot say no. And this in itself reinforces this desire of just owning 
he wasn't concerned about the, the soul, the humanness of the individual that he'd snuffed a life from. He was interested with the vessel that they inhabited and he wanted that for himself. And again, it's not covered in the movies, is it? We don't see Zac Efron dressing up a corpse and having sex with a putrefied body because that ain't Hollywood, right? But then serial killers isn't Hollywood because these were real people who got heinously murdered and whose corpses didn't have the dignity even of a burial. They were just for his pleasure. Also, he severed the heads of many of his victims and he did this with a hacksaw. In fact, they believe that he decapitated at least a dozen and he took those heads back to his home and the belief is that he indulged in sex acts with them. That's very similar to Edmund Kemper in this regard, the co-ed killer. I've done a video on that if you haven't seen it. He also used to do that. And then Ted Bundy would discard the heads in remote locations once he'd done with them. Terrifyingly, he even took one of them to his girlfriend's where when she was out, he incinerated the head in her fire when she wasn't there. He also used to take trophies. We do see that classically with a lot of serial killers. They love to take trophies from the victims because it means that they have an anchor to the crime. And he would take clothes, jewelry, take other personal possessions. And then he would actually keep some, but others he'd give as presents to the women that he knew. Because seeing those women wearing items of jewellery that he had taken from the bodies of these poor women that he had brutalised and knowing that they were wearing those victims' jewellery turned him on. It really did. That was the ultimate power, wasn't it? That they didn't know they were literally wearing a dead woman's or dead girl's jewellery. And he also used to take photographs of the victims and he was asked why he did this. And this is what he said. When you work hard to do something right, you don't want to forget it. Again, the level of disassociation with the reality of what we're talking about in that moment is just phenomenal. If this was a nicely carved cabinet, a newly fitted kitchen, a favour for somebody where you've created an art installation, you're going to take some pictures of it, right? Because when you work hard to do something, you don't want to forget it. But when we're talking about the brutal murders of innocent girls, it kind of takes your breath away that he would ever have spoken those words. Obviously, we know that he took those pictures so that he could remember. That's the key. Because by looking at those photographs, he's taken back to the moment of the crime and he can relive it. And that's powerful motivator for so many serial killers. And it's also worth noting that as opposed to in the films where there's just this very linear way of him killing, you know, he attacks a woman, he kills her, he dumps a body, that isn't how it played out at all. He used to take the victim's bodies back to his apartment. And this was because he wanted to specifically reenact grisly scenes from the covers of detective magazines. Literally. So you know when you or I go and buy a crime magazine and it's got some terrifying front? Well, he would see that as a potential opportunity to use props to reenact it, those props actually being human bodies. So this need for control was massive. And it also is demonstrated in a relationship that he had with Diane Edwards. Now, often Diane Edwards is referred to under a pseudonym, Stephanie Brooks in the media. So he met her whilst he was studying Chinese at the University of Washington. She came from a very well-off family. And when Bundy met her, she represented something to him. She represented the ideal. He described her as beautiful. The way that she dressed was impeccable. She was very attractive, very personable. She had a nice car. She had great parents. This is his words. But he always felt ultimately that she was out of his league and he had these real feelings of inadequacy. And to be fair, 
they were confirmed because she actually did end the relationship in 1968. And it seems that this was because she felt he didn't have any purpose. He wasn't really going anywhere. So clearly from the family that she came from, the expectations to have ambition and to do well were very important to her and her family. And he possibly wasn't meeting the grade at that point. However, in spite of the fact that they break up in 1968, and this is probably going to be a surprise to a lot of you, and it certainly was to me, because I always thought that that was kind of the end of their relationship, but it wasn't. They rekindled their relationship in California in 1973. They went on a trip, and she was blown away by his transformation. He was on the verge of a promising political career, and... It seems that the couple were so together at this point that they even became engaged at one point. So Ted Bundy has managed to achieve the very pinnacle of what he had wanted. This beautiful woman, this well societally motivated woman, this woman who came from a great family who could have created opportunities potentially for him. Suddenly she's back in his life and she wants him. And then he just disappears from her life without explanation. Just goes. Stops returning her calls. She never saw him again. In fact, there was a last time that she actually managed to contact him. And she managed to do this on the phone. And she basically poses the question, why did you end the relationship? And he replied in a flat, calm voice, Stephanie? I have no idea what you mean. And he hung up. Ted Bundy later admitted, I just wanted to prove to myself that I could have married her. He deliberately rekindled that relationship and planned the rejection in advance. That was vengeance for her breaking up with him. And again, what was that telling you in that moment of hearing what he said? It's telling you he's got this demonstrable need to be in control. And what a lack of empathy. The fact that he's held on to the resentment that she rejected him. And he's used that to fuel this anger, this vengeance, this desire to make her pay. And he does it. I mean, potentially he had a world that he could have walked into that he could have only dreamt of. And instead, he throws it all away because how dare she ever have rejected him? Bundy, in my opinion, was the ultimate predator. And when I've gone through exploring when he first started killing, it's unclear. It really is. It's unclear as to a specific time that he definitely began killing people. In fact, even when you listen to his later confessions, he didn't divulge the information. What he claims is that his predator phase began mid-1970s. That would be when he was 27. Prior to this, he said that he was an amateur. That was the word he used. So he said that he was only willing to provide details of his predator phase kills. Arguably, why he did that could be linked to his pride. Arguably, his prior killings may not, in his mind, have been up to scratch. He could ultimately have believed that they didn't have the standard that he wanted to achieve, and therefore he wasn't going to state claim of those. Or it could even be that he was just ashamed of some of his earlier crimes, because he once stated that there were some murders he would never talk about. He said that that was because they were committed too close to home, too close to family or involved victims who were very young. Now, whether that's because as his notoriety grew, he started to understand the way that society feels about people who kill children, because there is no sexy child molester serial killer out there, is there? You know, it's not the way our minds work. Even women 
who get married to violent offenders tend to draw the line at child molesting killers. It's as simple as that. It's not something that our psyche deals very well with. And in fact, if a woman did marry somebody who happened to be a child molester who had killed children, there would be something deeply flawed in her psyche and probably she would need some serious help as well. But when we talk about the phase that he gets into where he's happy to be the predatory killer who was organizing his mind sophisticated, he did have a signature. So his specific victim profile was usually white middle-class females. They were usually between the ages of 15 and 25. They were usually students. There's a lot of usually because I'm going to talk about the ones that fall outside of that. They were always strangers. And one of the things that the press talks about is the fact that many seem to look like his ex-girlfriend Diane Edwards. So they had long hair parted in the middle, but with respect as well, that was a very common hairstyle at the time, but I do get that they all were very attractive. And Bundy actually dismissed that comparison and connection. He said that the only requirement was that they were young and attractive, and they all were indeed very young and attractive. Another feature of his signature were the post-mortem activities that I've talked about before. So he didn't need to do any of those things to kill his victims. He did that to satisfy his psychological needs. Now his MO, it evolved over time. As we would expect, we know modus operandi tends to be perfected. This is common among serial killers and indeed, at least for a long period of time, he definitely learned to perfect it. First of all, he would drink large amounts of alcohol because this would diminish his inhibitions. And it seems that his early crimes were motivated by voyeurism. So from a very young age, he would look through women's windows. He would try to find a girl or a woman who was undressing. Also, he would rummage through his neighbor's bins, hopefully finding pictures of naked women. Initially, his criminal behavior involved doing things like breaking into properties and then he would beat his sleeping victims. So the early victims that Bundy later admitted to, who he literally carried out this kind of crime with, were 18-year-old Karen Sparks. Now, it's a horrific crime. Karen was actually a dancer, so clearly very fit and healthy. She was at the University of Washington. And this was on the 4th of January, 1974. So Bundy breaks into her basement apartment. He beat her really brutally with a bedpost and then he sexually assaulted her with it. And that actually penetrated her so severely that it caused her horrific internal damage. It was so savage, it actually split her bladder. She somehow survived amazingly. She wasn't actually discovered until 7 p.m. the following evening. And she was so badly injured that she didn't even regain consciousness for 10 days. She's unconscious in hospital for 10 days. She was left with permanent disabilities. Obviously, she couldn't dance again in the way that she was doing. She had to learn to walk again. And she had literally no memory of the attack at all. And I'm kind of glad that that's the case. I'm glad that although she had these horrible injuries that were definitely life limiting and ended certain aspirations for her. I'm glad that she didn't remember the actual event. I'm glad that she doesn't remember the trauma of being beaten in that way and being brutalized in that way. Now, just weeks later, so it's the 1st of February, 1974, 20 year old Linda Ann Healy, really attractive student. She used to actually give the daily weather and ski reports on the local radio. So Bundy breaks into her basement apartment in the house that she shares. He beat her, then he dressed her in blue jeans, white blouse and boots, and he carried her away. Now bizarrely, he also made her bed and hung her blooded nightdress in the wardrobe before leaving. So that kind of creating that crime scene, that's a real introduction, isn't it, to somebody who's taking time with what he's doing. In the first half of 1974, wow, college students literally begin disappearing. One per month. This is from the Pacific Northwest area. And it seems like as Bundy's MOs developed, 
he realizes that he can get more sophisticated in his crimes, make it easier for himself. So he stops the home invasions. Instead, he uses his ability to manipulate and to deceive, to lure victims into his car. And he figures out that the way to do this is to make himself look very vulnerable. So he feigns injury, an arm in a sling or a cast on his leg, and he asks for help. And you can imagine any of us, if somebody seems to be struggling and they have an injury, instantly we're taken off guard because, hey, how dangerous can somebody who's injured be? Already immobile? What kind of a problem can they pose? And it speaks to that level of care and compassion of the average human being, which is when somebody actually asks you for help, how many of us feel comfortable saying no, particularly to somebody who's injured? Because on the whole, it's not good not to help people who are injured, you know? It's actually a pro-social experience to want to go and help them. And to reject that isn't something that pretty much the vast majority of men and women and children would feel comfortable doing. So when he asks for help, most people go over and are like, yeah, sure. At this point, he incapacitates them instantly, hits them with a crowbar. He then handcuffs them. The front seat of his car had been removed so he could stash them, you know, the passenger side seat. Then, as you know, he scoped out the area, so he takes them to a pre-selected secondary location. He would then strangle them whilst raping them. And at this point, he would remove their clothes. Partly this was to do with the ceremony and partly this is to do with removing the evidence, so to speak. Now around this time where we've got these students one a month go missing, two students actually report a man that they'd encountered who had an arm in a sling driving a tan Volkswagen Beetle. They said that he was trying to carry books and he asked them for help and they got suspicious and didn't feel comfortable, so they actually reported this. Now, if the dots had been joined at that point by the police, he could have been stopped, and a huge amount of lives could have been saved, but it didn't happen. 12th of March, 1974, got 19-year-old Donna Gail Manson. She's an only child, an only child. She's a really hard-working student. She's undertaking a English degree. She'd left to attend a jazz concert, but she never arrived. And her remains have never been discovered. Then on the 17th of April, 1974, 18-year-old Susan Elaine Rancourt, she disappears. She was a straight A student, also studying at the University of Central Washington. Now she had left an evening meeting on the university campus and she just never made it back to her dorm. She just vanished without trace. And the police did not have even a shred of evidence. And it's also worth noting that unlike most of Bundy's victims, she actually had blonde hair. 6th of May, 1974, we've got 20 year old Roberta Kathleen Parks. She just disappears. Now she was at that point at quite a low point in her life. She'd rowed with her father. He then had a heart attack. She also had boyfriend problems and she had drunk a lot on the night that she vanished. So she'd had a difficult time. She's probably drowning her sorrows. Who hasn't done that? And then she just vanishes. She's abducted from the campus of the Oregon State University. Now, according to Bundy, he actually forced her to undress. Then he broke her neck whilst raping her. And then he actually drove her from Oregon to Taylor Mountain and she was still alive and conscious for the entire five hour trip. He then arrived where he wanted to arrive, raped her again, and then he beat her to death and he completely smashed her face and skull in and then he decapitated her. Now, you can hear, can't you, that this is a serial killer who is confident about what they're doing. They feel competent in the way that they're killing. Now the police, clearly, whilst they don't know who is doing this, they can see that there is a pattern occurring. You know, all the missing women are young, attractive, white college students have all got long hair parted in the middle. In all the cases, there's no physical evidence left for the police to go on. And it's at this point that the media named the suspect the campus killer. So they know 
they have somebody targeting young women. They know that university students are at risk. 1st of June, 1974. 22 year old Brenda Carol Ball, she disappears. She's described by all her friends as a real free spirit. Just one of those girls who just was exploring so many different paradigms of thought. She'd been drinking at the Flame Tavern until about 2 a.m. She was listening to live music. She had asked for a lift home from a member of the band, but he was actually going sadly in an opposite direction. Such sliding doors moments, aren't there? She just wanted to get a lift off one of the guys in the band, and if she had, this name would not be on this list today. But instead, she's last seen talking to a man with brown hair and an arm in a sling. 11th of June, 1974, 18 year old Georgian Hawkins just disappears. Now she was known as a really happy, confident, popular, really much loved young woman. She'd actually been named Daffodil Princess at her high school. And she traveled state, meeting children and attending charity events because of that. So she was adept at socializing. She was adept at building relationships. And she basically just left a party. She was returning to her lodgings. She spoke to a friend at her window and she had just 50 feet to walk back to her dorm. And she never made it back. And Bundy, he later claimed that he'd lured her into the car. He pretended to have a broken arm. He was on crutches potentially. And he dropped his briefcase and asked for her to help. She was going to help. Of course she was going to help. This is a young woman who's known to be very personable. Her agreeability is her downfall. It's usually the thing that makes life easier for us, but in certain situations like this, predators take advantage of it. And he hits her with a crowbar. When she regained consciousness on the floor of his car, he hit her again. He then drove her to a secondary place. He strangled her. He then spent the night with her body, incredibly as well. He actually then returned to the crime scene and that was whilst the police were there and he did that because he wanted to retrieve an earring and a shoe from the car park. And ironically, witnesses later reported seeing a man on crutches with a leg in his cast around the time that Georgian vanished. He revisited her corpse on three occasions as well. Now, there is some irony when I cover these cases as regards what Ted Bundy was actually doing at the time of these crimes. And like I said, it's been an education learning more about him. So Bundy was working as the assistant director of the Seattle Crime Prevention Advisory Commission during this time. He even wrote a pamphlet on rape prevention. That's right. Ted Bundy, rapist, killer, necrophiliac, was writing advice pamphlets on rape prevention, working for the Crime Prevention Advisory Commission. That in itself just really spanks of that arrogance, doesn't it? This is a guy who feels he's so superior that he actually places himself in the eye of the storm, so to speak. And later on, he worked at the Department of Emergency Services, which is an agency basically involved in the search for missing women. Yeah, for the missing women he had abducted and killed. So he inserts himself there. And it was here that he met and dated Carol Ann Boone. She actually proves an important figure further down the lane. So just stay with me, but this is when he meets her. And it's interesting to me that he could actually maintain relationships with women whilst in parallel callously killing them because he manages to do this. He's adept at building and maintaining relationships with women without harming them whilst carrying out the most brutal harm on others. So now we've got lots of girls disappearing and we've got attacks rising. These are getting widely reported in the media. And as a result of this, hitchhiking drops sharply and clearly the local community start putting real pressure on the police to apprehend the suspect. The major problem is they have no physical evidence. All they have is just lots of similar 
abductions taking place. So they can kind of link it in that way, but there's no direct evidence to say one person is doing this. They do know that all the disappearances take place at night. Usually the disappearances take place where there is ongoing construction work and it tended to be within a week of midterm or final exams. All of the victims would be seen wearing loose trousers or blue jeans before they were abducted and multiple reports at several crime scenes were that there was a man wearing a cast or a sling and also driving a brown or tan Volkswagen Beetle. So they've got this evidence, but it still doesn't seem to be enough to have them pinpoint this is definitely one person. Now, on the 14th of July, 1974, two abductions took place in broad daylight. And this is from a really busy beach at Lake Sammamish State Park. So Brazen is the understatement here, isn't it? He's got to be at this point so convinced of his sophistication in getting away with it that he can just do it anywhere. Because he's either brazen or stupid. Because he's seen talking to women. He even introduced himself as Ted. So he used his real name. His arm... Um, is in a sling. He's asking for help because he's got, as far as he's trying to create this ruse, a sailboat in the car that he wants to go and sail. Now, three witnesses see him approach and leave with 23-year-old Janice Ann Ott. She lived in Issaquah and she worked as a caseworker at the Youth Service Centre. Four hours after that, 19-year-old Denise Marie Naslund disappears from the same beach. She lived in Seattle and she was studying to become a computer programmer. She's a really kind and helpful person. So absolutely perfect candidate to fall for Bundy's ruse. She was actually there with her boyfriend. So she'd just gone to the toilet. Meant to be away a few minutes. Never came back. Now, Bundy claimed he forced one to watch whilst he killed the other. Now, he denied this later on, but that's what he initially said, that he forced one to watch the other. And can you imagine that poor boyfriend just waiting for his girlfriend to come back, having a lovely day out? She never returns. Because little does he know at that point that she has been abducted and is being murdered by one of the world's most prolific serial killers. Now, with more and more women disappearing, King County Police released a description. They released a description of him and the car that he's driving. Now, so after this description of the car and the e-fit, so to speak, is released, Elizabeth Klopfer, Bundy's girlfriend at the time, and Anne Rule, who was a former work colleague and a University Washington psychology professor, all gave Bundy's name. Which is really interesting, isn't it? Because his girlfriend actually thought, yeah, this sounds like Ted. He looks like Ted. He's got a car like Ted. Could be Ted. But unfortunately, the police were getting inundated at this moment in time. They were getting like 200 names every single day. So tragically, for some reason, Bundy's actually ruled out. And the reason for this was just so biased. Basically, he had no adult convictions, he was a law student, and he didn't really seem like a likely suspect. And that's why he gets ruled out. In September 1974, skeletal remains of Janice, Denise, and Jorgen are found in Issaquah. And the following years, skeletal remains of Roberta, Brenda, Susan, and Linda are found on Taylor Mountain also transpires that Bundy often hiked there. August 1974, Bundy moves to Salt Lake City, Utah. He wants to study law. At this point, he dates at least a dozen other women during the time there. And it's at this point that he discovers that he actually didn't have the intellectual capacity for a law course. And he described this as finding out about himself as a great disappointment because he did have these feelings of inadequacy. In fact, he talks about throughout his life feeling very inadequate. And I think we can all agree that most serial killers are inadequate to some degree. They don't seem to be, but they have feelings of it, 
lightly because they can't actually have really good relationships with other human beings. And let's be honest, that is what makes us human. So it had plagued him his whole life. And I think one of the areas that he felt he stood out was intellectually, but he didn't succeed. So even though he'd gone there to take this new career move, he wasn't making it in the way that he had anticipated he would. So also, this would have added to stress levels. Of course it would. And we know that serial killers, when they are stressed, kill because there seems to be an increase of killing during periods of stressful experiences and encounters. And certainly it doesn't put an end to his killing spree when he moves there. He remains just as prolific. So the 2nd of September, 1974, he rapes and strangles a still, with respect, unidentified hitchhiker in Idaho. Always really sad when it's a Jane Doe. They don't know who it was. 2nd of October, 1974, he killed 16-year-old Nancy Wilcox in holiday. She was a really popular girl. She enjoyed cheerleading, um, participating in a local church. All she did was she left school to buy a pack of chewing gum. And she was last seen in a light-coloured VW. Now, her disappearance was originally considered a runaway situation. And the state of Utah wasn't at this point on high alert like Washington State because they didn't know that Ted Bundy had moved there and was a serial killer. So the authorities at this point are completely unaware that this predator has basically moved to a new hunting ground. And according to Bundy, he took her remains and burned them and buried them 200 miles away. And actually they were never found. On the 18th of October, 1974, 17-year-old Melissa Ann Smith, she disappears from Midvale. She was known as a very caring woman. She was literally on her way home from comforting a friend who'd argued with a boyfriend. Now, Melissa's body was found in a nearby mountainous area about nine days later. She'd been badly beaten, raped, sodomized, and she'd been strangled with nylon stocking. Her head had been really severely damaged, probably with a crowbar. And the postmortem actually indicated that she might have remained alive for up to seven days before being killed, which is just harrowing to imagine. And like I said, not something that I was aware of until I covered this case. 31st of October, 1974, 17-year-old Laura Ann Aim. She disappeared near Leahy. She was described by people as a bit of a drifter, but she was always in touch with her family. All she had done was to leave a cafe on Halloween night. She'd gone to park and her naked body was found nine miles away. She was also, similar to the last case, beaten, raped, sodomized, strangled with a nylon stocking. Her face was fully beaten beyond any recognition. Bundy later actually said when Reflecting on this case, he'd shampooed her hair, he'd applied makeup to both Melissa and Laura post-mortem. Now, as I've covered, one of the ways that Bundy would lure his victims to his car would be to feign injury. But it seems that he had a different ruse as well, which again was part of his MO. And this was that he would pretend to be an authority figure. So he'd pretend to be a policeman or a fire officer, a little bit like Wayne Cousins, who actually was a police officer, but feigned that he was actually on duty when he procured Sarah Everard's because obviously people don't like to say no to authority. We see this when we see experiments done by Milgram where people believe that they're being told to do something by an authority figure that inflicts horrific pain and potential death on others and they do it even though they don't want to because they're being told to by somebody who's apparently in charge. You know, you displace your sense of trust to a different position because you believe that they have control because of the fact that they have a job that essentially gives them that control. So he used this knowing that that was the psyche of individuals. So one of his surviving victims was actually able to give an account of her experience. So 8th of November, 1974, Bundy attempts to abduct 18 year old Carol Deronche. So Carol is just in a shopping mall. At this point, she's approached by Bundy, who tells her that somebody's been trying to break into her car. So she makes an assumption at this point that he's a police officer. He asks her to accompany him to the car to see if anything's missing, so she goes with him. At this point, she confirms that nothing's been taken, 
and he tells her that the suspect at this point must have been taken to the substation. So during the conversation, she's obviously a little bit worried because she takes quite a lot of notes about him. And one of the things that really sticks with her is the fact that he seems to have quite a distinctive way of walking. And if any of you have seen him in videotape, particularly when he's being indicted, you will notice the way that he walks. It is quite unique. And it's this walk that lets her later on pick him out of a police lineup. So as well as remembering his appearance, she immediately recognises his walk. And he asks her to come with him at this point and says that he wants her to fill out a complaint form. So she follows him outside. But she becomes immediately suspicious when he tries to open the door of a laundrette, which was locked. And it's at this point she asks if she can see his ID and he flashes this silver badge at her. So she goes to his vehicle and she notices this white or beige Volkswagen Beetle, but it's got a rip on the top of the back seat. She can see rust stops on the front. It's not got a license plate. And even though she's with him, she's really taking note. That this does not feel like a police officer would be driving this. And it's whilst driving, he suddenly stops. Carol's really nervous at this point and she asks him why have we stopped and also they've stopped outside a place that certainly isn't a police station. Now it's at this point he grabs her left arm, he forcefully handcuffs her and she's trying to get out. She's not complying as you know guys I always say the same thing in situations like this do not comply, scream, bite, fight, do everything to remove yourself from that situation. So he grabs her arm, he puts his arm around her neck, he then puts a gun to her head and he threatens to blow her head off, but she is not having it. So she manages to get out of the car, but then he grabs her and then they struggle again. And she realizes at this point that he's holding a crowbar and she actually grabs it because she knows that if she doesn't, he's gonna hit her with it. And she scratched him so hard to such extent that she broke all of her nails and she actually manages to break free she runs into the road and at this point a car fortunately stops for her and luckily the handcuffs that he'd had he'd actually fastened both handcuffs to the same wrist of hers so that was a saving grace now carol went straight to the police station obviously now later that evening we know that at this point Bundy has had a failed attempt so he's still going to be hungry for a kill and he is indeed. So 17 year old Deborah Jean Kent, she just disappeared in Bountiful. This is a girl who's known to be incredibly funny, kind, friendly, sweet. In fact she was described by family members as a mother hen to her four younger siblings. And she'd literally gone and watched a play at Viewmont High School. She'd left around 10.30 p.m. to pick up her brother from a nearby skating rink. And witnesses said that they heard this loud screaming coming from the school car park. They also saw a light colored Volkswagen Beetle then speeding away. Is it just me? Every time a cover case is like this, I'm like, if you hear screaming that's loud in a school parking lot, I don't know. Why don't you just drive up and see what's happening? Why don't you run over and have a look? It's like so frustrating, isn't it? I mean, this is on a school car park and you're hearing loud screaming. This means that somebody's in horrendous distress. Call the police. Anyway, investigators do find a key in the car park from where she vanished and it turns out that that key was a key that would have been needed to unlock the handcuffs that were removed from Carol de Ronch's wrists. So they link it that way, but Deborah's body's never found. November 1974, Bundy's girlfriend, Klopfer, she calls the King County Police a second time second why is she still his girlfriend if you suspect that your other half might be seeing off other women you know and he looks like it and drives a car like it and you suspect it's potentially him what are you doing sharing a home with him is it just me it's weird but nonetheless 
with respect to her, she is brave because she isn't going to hide behind her relationship. She's not going to make sure that a man who potentially is guilty of doing horrible things is free. You know, she's concerned about these girls and she's not doing what a lot of people do and sitting in silence. It's just that I think she should have just got out straight away. Because if you think there is even a slightest possibility that your partner might be capable of murdering people, you're probably not in a great relationship. But hey, we all have our insecurities and maybe she had them to the point where she stayed in relationships that weren't good enough for her. But she calls the King County Police a second time. She's read that women around Salt Lake City are now disappearing. And she's like, mm, what is the similarity here? Well, Ted has left this area and it seems that the deaths have ended. He's gone to Salt Lake City and it seems that the deaths are increasing. Could there be a link? And she actually gets interviewed at this point. Now, December 1974, Klipfer calls the Salt Lake County Sheriff's Office and she again gives Bundy's name. But at this point, they've got no evidence linking him at all because unfortunately, the police in different states just didn't connect the dots. Despite the fact that she's contacted the police specifically to inform them that she thinks that it might be her partner, for whatever reason, nothing is getting connected. So basically, there is nothing meaning that he's gonna get brought in and questioned about this. And bizarrely, in spite of the fact that she's contacted the police, she's still meeting Bundy. But I guess, in her defense, maybe she's thinking, well, hey, I've rang the police now on three different occasions and basically given the name and car and description of my partner and they've not done anything about it. Maybe that validated her belief that he was innocent and put her mind at rest. Who knows? All I'm saying is, you know, if you think your partner looks like a serial killer, drives a car like a serial killer, kind of has things in the house that makes you suspect it might be a serial killer, that you feel so moved by this that you want to speak to the police on three potential occasions, that maybe, I don't know, you're living with a serial killer. That kind of thing. Or at least you're dating with one. That kind of thing. Maybe take a note. Just think, hey, if I'm suspecting that this person has this potential and tenacity and could actually be the person going out and doing this, maybe it's better if I think about dumping them. Bit of life advice there. 12th of January, 1975, 23-year-old Karen Eileen Campbell just disappears in Snowmass Village. Now, she had been on a vacation with her fiancé. I mean, literally on holiday with her fiancé. She's walking down this well-lit hallway at the Wildwood Inn and she just vanishes. I mean, it's shocking to imagine that this is what can happen to any of us, isn't it? She's just on a holiday and she's walking down a well-lit hallway and she's gone. Her frozen naked body is found about a month later. It's just next to a dirt road, just outside the resort. When they found her, her eyes, her tongue and her larynx were actually missing because of animal predation. And you just have to think about how that would be for the family. They found out that she had been killed by blows to her head from a blunt instrument. She had multiple fractures and it left this distinctive linear groove depressions on the skull. Also, it seems that her body had sharp wounds from a weapon, so deep cuts, and she had been beaten so brutally that one of her teeth had separated from her guns. So gain this barbaric dehumanization because when you're disfiguring the face of somebody to a position when they're completely unrecognizable, when on one level you can say, well, that's a way of making it more difficult for the police forensically to understand who that person is and therefore difficult to pin the crime on the person who's done it because it creates distance whilst they figure that out. But the other thing is the rage and the removal of an individual's features. It's a way of completely dehumanizing them, isn't it? It's a way of making that person no longer the person that they were. And the amount of anger and internal rage you must feel to want to do that to someone. 15th of March, 1975, 26-year-old Julie Cunningham disappears. This is 100 miles northeast of Snowmass. 
she was known as an outgoing, friendly, popular young woman. And she had recently gone through quite a bad breakup with her boyfriend. It had been hard on her. Bundy was on crutches and classic. Asked her to carry his ski boots to the car. At this point, he grabs her, he handcuffs her, he assaults her, he strangles her at a secondary site. He also went back to that body three weeks later and they never were able to recover that body. So again, one that was never brought home to her family. Then on the 6th of April, 1975, we have 25-year-old Denise Lynn Olverson. She disappears at Utah, Colorado border, basically, just near there. She had been married for five years and all she'd done is she'd gone on a bike ride. She'd had an argument with her husband and she never returned home. Her body was never recovered as well. Just those moments, you know, you make a decision just because you've had a bad time with your partner in that moment, you're just like gonna get some space. And even for him, you know, the last experience of their relationship was that they'd argued and that she'd left because of that argument. I can't imagine the survivor guilt that he has, but it's just ultimate, isn't it, that? You know, she just went to get some space and air and she never came home. The 6th of May, 1975, Bundy abducts 12-year-old, that's right, 12-year-old Lynette Dawn Culver in Pocatello. I think that's how you pronounce it. It might be Pocatello, but I think it's Pocatello. She's a really happy young girl. She's doing really well at school. She was last seen by witnesses leaving on a bus during her lunch break. Now, 12, bear in mind. Bundy sexually assaulted her in a hotel room and then he drowned her. He disposed of her body in a river and it was never recovered. So again, that poor little girl's body never came home. 28th of June, 1975, Susan Curtis, she vanishes from Provo. She was described as a determined, very responsible and athletic girl. She'd attended a ball at a university conference. She left to just go back to her room to brush her teeth and she never came back. Body never recovered again. Now, remember this is all going on in this new state. Meanwhile, we've got the police in Washington completely puzzled. This massive murder spree that they've been dealing with, it's just suddenly ended. Of course, we know it's coincided with Bundy's move to Salt Lake City in Utah. Now the police are using this new database technology at this point to sort through loads of the data that they've collected. Because remember there were hundreds of people being suggested as potential criminals being phoned in about these girls missing. So they have thousands of names and they've gone through them all and they actually cut down those names, those thousands that they got in to 26 potential people who could have been guilty of this crime. Now Bundy's name was one of them. Now on the 16th of August, 1975, Bundy gets finally arrested. This is by Utah Highway Patrol Officer Bob Hayward. And he basically is observing the BW and it's cruising a residential area in Granger and it's 2.30 a.m. The minute that the officer kind of lets him know that he wants to pull him over, he just flees at high speed and so he also turns the lights off because he's seen the patrol car and he wants to make it difficult for the chase. But after a short period of time, Bundy stops the car. Haywood notices at this point the crowbar behind the driver's seat. Also, he sees that the front passenger seat has been removed and placed on the rear seats. Now, Bundy says that the reason he tried to evade the police is because he'd been smoking dope and he doesn't want to get into trouble for it. But obviously, anybody who's been within five feet, six feet of somebody smoking a spliff, you can smell the weed, right? And this is an officer who deals with it constantly. And this is in the 70s. The guy would be around a lot of weed, couldn't smell it. So that causes him some concern. He starts searching the car. Whilst he searches that car, he also finds a ski mask, a second mask made from tights, handcuffs, trash bags, a coil of rope and an ice pick, which is literally a kill kit. I think we can all agree with that. But the police at this point, he just 
assumes that this is a guy who's going to go and burgle somebody's home. And I can understand that because your mind doesn't stretch to, oh, is this the guy who's murdering lots of innocent co-eds and children? So he's just thinking this is something that would be used to get into a home and then obviously handcuffs are helpful if somebody starts waking up and you have to subdue them, so to speak. He gets arrested by this officer for evading police. However, when they do some searches, Bundy's car happens to match the description from Carol's November 1974 attempted kidnapping. Turns out when they also look at records, Bundy's name has also been given in Clopfer's December 1974 phone call. So now we're starting to add up a little, right? Now, during a later search of Bundy's apartment, well, they find a guide to Colorado ski resorts. And there was a check mark by Wildwood Inn. This is where Carrie and Eileen Campbell disappeared from, remember? Also, brochure advertising Viewmont High School play in Bountiful. That's where Deborah Kent had disappeared. Now, this isn't ironically, whilst we were all screaming, surely this is enough to get him put in prison immediately. Essentially, that in itself isn't enough to hold him. It's only circumstantial, so he gets released on bail. Now, Bundy later said, searchers missed hidden stashes of Polaroid photographs of his victims. So they were that close to finding the photographs of his victims. And of course, the minute he gets released, he destroys them immediately. Also, he sells his VW Beetle, that's in September 1975, because he's disposing of the evidence. Bundy, at this point, has been placed under 24-hour surveillance, and the police interview Klopfer, obviously, the woman that he's been in a relationship with. This blew my mind when I started to kind of research the interview that she gave because she told them quite a significant amount of evidence that I think we can all agree, after I describe this to you, that there is much reason why she was calling the police and saying, could it be that Ted Bundy, the guy that I'm in a relationship with, is actually the murderer? Because I have some suspicious things around where we live. So she explains to them some of the, shall we say, unusual stroke unexplained objects in his apartment. And what were they? What were they? Well, they were crutches, bag of plaster of Paris, meat cleaver that was never used for cooking, surgical gloves, an oriental knife in a wooden case he kept in the glove compartment, a sack full of women's clothing. Is it just me? A sack full of women's clothing, a meat cleaver he never used for cooking, surgical gloves and just the odd bag of plaster of Paris. I mean, if I don't have a bag of plaster of Paris or, you know, spare crutches, because you never know when you're going to need them, do you? We've all been in a situation where we're like, oh my God, everything would have been all right if I just had those crutches. I need to go on eBay and order some. I mean, this is super weird stuff to have anywhere at the best of times, unless it's a charity store, some kind of weird home clearance, or, I don't know, a hospital. Also, she says to the police that one of the weird things that Bundy had about their relationship was that she wasn't allowed to cut her hair. And her hair was long and it was parted in the middle. Also, she said sometimes she would catch him examining her body as she slept with a torch under the covers. It's not creepy at all, is it? Not at all creepy. Nothing creepy about that. Just coming around in the middle of the night, your bloke's there with his little torch just looking at your body. Literally, that's what she said. Also, he kept a wheel brace taped in the boot of her car. Furthermore, she actually hadn't been with Bundy on the occasions Pacific Northwest victims had vanished. So she wasn't an alibi for him. You know, on the occasions that these women went missing, girls went missing, she actually couldn't state where he was. Now, the police did manage to trace Bundy's car and 
they were able to find hairs that were similar to Karen Campbell, Melissa Smith, and Carol Deranche. Carol, though, the girl who survived, as we know, she actually was incredible, and she immediately picked him out of the lineup. However, in spite of what seems genuinely compelling evidence, was still considered insufficient evidence to actually link him to the murders. But clearly we have a first witness testimony. She's the victim, Carol, of course, who can say, well, he attempted to kidnap me. So at this point, he is ultimately found guilty of kidnapping and assault. So June 1976, he's sentenced to 1 to 15 years. And Ted Bundy is actually placed in solitary confinement for several weeks. And the reason for this is after he's been placed in prison, he's found hiding in a prison yard with an escape kit. He's got road maps, airline schedules, and a social security card. I mean, he's inventive, isn't he? He's got no intention of staying in prison at that point. And it seems like this really did start the pattern in Bundy's behavior whilst incarcerated. He was always literally looking for a way out. Again, interesting psyche. This is somebody who's essentially been caught bang to rights when it comes down to the kidnapping of this girl. He's been tried, he's been convicted, he's got one to 15 years, and he does not feel that he is somebody who should have to serve that time. He wants out. He does not like people being in control and dominion of him. That is his particular desire, to be in control and of dominion of others. He's not enjoying the fact that he is locked up. I know you're not meant to, but most criminals just kind of accept and acknowledge it's the time because they've done the crime, not Ted Bundy. So October 1976 is finally charged with Karen Campbell's murder. So they have enough to say, yeah, this is our guy. It is mind-blowing that I have covered this in other cases with prolific serial killers. The arrogance level, the superiority level, the delusional level as well, in their absolute narcissism, just speaks volumes when they decide that the best person to represent themselves in the court system is them. Yes, the completely unqualified person to go ahead and actually try to get them off of a murder offence is indeed them, the unqualified serial killer. But we see it. And in true narcissistic serial killer style, Bundy chooses indeed to represent himself. So he does this for lots of reasons. But because of this, there are some rules that he is allowed, essentially, to use in his favour. So he isn't required to wear shackles at the preliminary court hearing. Also, he's given permission by the judge to research in the library. And because of this, he manages to jump from a second floor window. Yep. So he's just like managed to create a situation where he's allowed to research in a particular area that allows him to escape. Now he injures his ankle in the process, of course he does, because he's jumped and that's gonna cause him pain and a bit of a problem. But he does manage nonetheless to avoid police searches and roadblocks for six days. Now he gets lost, by the way, during this period of time. He's in Woodland and he basically manages to steal a car eventually, which he's then stopped by the police for because he's driving erratically. And when they search his car, they find in the car in situ the evidence maps that the prosecution were using to indicate the location of Karen's body. Because of course, because Ted Bundy was representing himself, he was entitled to view the prosecution evidence. It shows that the escape had been planned, but for the police, this is going to be really helpful where they're like, that looks like court evidence. Could you be the guy who's escaped? And so on and so forth. But he's very astute at creating these opportunities to get away. Now, I will note that during this period, the prosecution murder case was actually falling apart. So him doing this did not work in his favor because 
genuinely, it turns out that the prosecution case didn't have really enough to pin the crime on him. So if he'd just gone back to prison quietly and accepted the time that he needed to serve, he probably would have got away with stuff. But instead, he can't help himself, can he? So he devises this second escape plan. And I will give you this, he is a bodacious criminal. He does not care about rules and regulations. He does not feel that the rules apply to him. And somehow, do not ask me why or how it occurred, but he manages to get hold of a prison floor plan. Also a hacksaw blade from other inmates. He then loses 16 kilograms in weight. Surely somebody should have been like, Bundy's looking a bit unhealthy. It looks like he's lost quite a lot of weight. I mean, 16 kilograms is a lot of weight. This guy was not a huge guy anyway, but okay, no one's noticing. And so he takes the materials he's got and he saws a hole through the ceiling. He crawls through the space in that ceiling. He breaks through the chief jailer's apartment, as you do. Who doesn't do that? He steals clothes from the chief jail's apartment, just walks out the front door. That's literally what he did. And he actually had stuffed his bed with books and files and he then covered them with a Ted Bundy shaped blanket, clearly. And they didn't discover that he'd gone for more than 17 hours. Bear in mind, that's a long time. And by this time, Bundy was in Chicago. It's actually believed that he'd had $500 smuggled into the prison by visitors, including Carol Ann Boone that I mentioned earlier on. I mean, how manipulative is this guy? And how creative is this guy? Like the Houdini of the criminal underworld without a doubt. And what we really see now highlighted is Bundy's true psychology. Because remember, this is a man who's escaped from prison for the second time He's on the run. You would think that at this point he's gonna lie low, right? But it's just not in his nature. It's not in his vision. It's not in his mindset. This man is addicted to killing. And so he instantly goes back on the hunt. He rents a room at the Oak Boarding House in Tallahassee. That's near Florida State University campus. He goes under a pseudonym, Chris Hagen and it's Saturday 14th of January that Bundy's seen at a bar adjacent to the university campus. This is next door to the Chi Omega sorority house. On the 14th of January, 1978, Kathy Kleiner had attended a wedding of a close friend who was a student nurse. So after the reception, she returns to Chi Omega sorority house to her small room that she shared with Karen Chandler. She changes into her pajamas and she studies in bed whilst Karen read quietly on her side of the room. So they're just relaxing, getting on with what they needed to do. They both go to sleep around 10.30 p.m. It's around 2.45 a.m. Bundy approaches the Chi Amiga Serenity House. Outside the back door, there's a pile of firewood. He picks up a log. There's a combination lock on the back door that's broken. He creeps inside, upstairs to the second floor landing. He enters the first room. 21-year-old Margaret Bowman's. She's sleeping alone. He strikes her on the forehead with a log with so much force that basically it crushed and split open her skull. Then he strangles her with a pair of tights. Next, he crosses the landing. He enters 20-year-old Lisa Levy's room. He beats her, rapes her, strangles her sexually assaults her with a hairspray bottle, tears off one of her nipples, he bites her several times, including a left buttock. Out of all of Bundy's crimes, this will be the first piece of physical evidence linking him. He crosses the landing again. He enters Kathy and Karen's room, trips over a trunk between the beds. He wakes Kathy up. In the dark, she just sees a black mass approach her then. She sees him lift a log over her head and brings it down on her. The first blow deeply lacerated her shoulder, then hits her in the face. He breaks her jaw in three places. The beds are so close together, he strikes Kathy, then turns and strikes Karen. And 
he would have undoubtedly have killed them both, without a doubt. But luckily, sorority sister, Nita Neary, she arrives back in her boyfriend's car just after a date that she's been on. Curtains are open, so the car headlights shine into their room. Bundy at this point panics. He goes downstairs. And as Nita enters through the back door and walks through the hall, she hears a sound. She hears somebody running downstairs. She enters the front hallway and she spots a man standing at the front door exiting the house. He's holding a log in his right hand and she's able to observe his profile before he leaves. And later she's able to give that description to the police. Now, Nita is disturbed by this, of course she is. She goes upstairs, unaware of what's happened. She wakes a roommate, she tells her what she's seen and she's discussing at this point whether to call the police and then all of a sudden, minutes later, Karen just staggers out of her room. She's covered in blood. She's suffered a concussion, she's broken her jaw, she's got lots of tea smithing, she's got a crushed finger. Now whilst helping her, they discover Kathy. She's sitting up in her bed, she's rocking and moaning. The beds and walls are just covered in blood. When paramedics arrive, they thought that Kathy had been shot in the face. Her jaw was that badly shattered. Her right cheek was torn. Her tongue was almost bitten in half and the attacks had taken less than 15 minutes. The same night, the same night, Bundy then broke into the basement apartment of student Cheryl Thomas. Neighbours heard banging from the apartment. They called her, but they got no answer. So they called 911, which is amazing because so often I tell stories and no one does anything, but they heard the banging, they called her, wanted to see whether she was all right, got no answer, called 911. They find her when they turn up severely beaten. She's still lying in bed. She's got a dislocated shoulder, a broken jaw. Her school's fractured in five places. She's actually left with permanent injuries that ended her dance career completely. Police found a semen stain and a mask made from a knotted pair of tights that contained two hairs similar to Bundy's. Before I move on, let's just explore this type of killing for a moment because there is a distinction, there is a massive difference in these attacks compared to Bundy's typical MO. So what we can say is this is much more disorganised, isn't it? I mean, just forensically, this is highly disorganised. He's left prints of his teeth and it's very much a blitz attack, isn't it? And it's in situ at their homes. So we can see that the stress of Bundy being on the run is clearly affecting his offending behaviour and also maybe this idea psychologically that he is time limited, that he knows that he's not going to get away with this forever and he just wants to carry out as many killings as possible. What we know in previous killings is usually meticulous in planning and he isn't here. These attacks were absolutely carried out in a frenzy. You know, usually this guy leaves no forensic evidence, but instead, as I said, he's left incriminating bite marks on Lisa Levy's body. Usually as well, we saw a cooling off period between killings, even if it's just a few weeks. But here, he's attacked several people on the same night. So a real change. Does he know his time is coming or is the stress sent him to a new position where his killing is concerned? Or is it that he's tripped into a different mind state? Maybe the darkness has fully consumed him and now it's less about consequences and more about satiating these warped desires that he has? On the 8th of February 1976, Bundy's driving a stolen white van and he approaches 14-year-old Leslie Parmenter. It's in a shopping centre, a car park in Jacksonville. He claims to be from the fire department, but he quickly leaves when her older brother turns up. Now, his arrival undoubtedly saved his sister's life, without a doubt, because the following morning, Ted Bundy abducts 12-year-old Kimberly Diana. Leach. That's from her Lake City Junior High School. Can you believe it? She was in a first class. She basically gets told to retrieve her homeroom teacher's purse, which she left. So she goes to do that. She goes to get the purse 
and then she's going to return to class. She never returns. Witness Clarence Anderson, well, they were the last person to see her alive. He was stuck behind a white van outside of school and he saw this 12-year-old little girl being led to a van by a man with a scowl on his face and she looked as though she'd been crying, which undoubtedly she would have been. This would be a 12-year-old child, absolutely terrified. But this person who witnessed it just presumed they were a father and a daughter and that's not an unusual presumption and an assumption to make it's at school this kid's in trouble they're being sent home and so on and so forth that poor little girl's body was found mummified under a collapsed hog pen in Sewanee River State Park seven weeks later that was 45 miles away from where she was abducted she'd been raped her throat had been cut her body was unclothed except for a white pullover around her neck. They found semen stains in the crotch of her underwear that were found near her body. They found blood on her blue jeans, which was also found near her body. And there were tears and rips in some of her clothes, which had been folded up. Also, the position of her body made them think that she'd been killed while she was being raped. Now, Bundy was actually in custody by the time Kimberly's body was found. And apparently, according to witnesses, he flew into a rage and he started hyperventilating when he realised that her body had been found. Now, he never, ever talked about her killing. And again, drawing you back to when he refused to talk about his earlier amateur type crimes, one of the ideas around that is that he didn't like admitting to harming children. I mean, there is no doubt he murdered little girls. She did differ as the other young child differed to his usual victim profile. But I do believe that he felt a real uncomfortable feeling about knowing that he had that predilection because he knew the way that other people viewed that kind of predilection. And like I said, I think that goes back to why he didn't want to talk about his earliest killings. They probably were all children. One of the hallmarks of Bundy that really stands out for me is just how desperate he was throughout all of this to control the script, essentially. He hated it when things didn't go according to plan. I mean, think about what I told you before about Carol DeRanche. You know, he didn't like the fact that she became suspicious in the car. He lost his opportunity to incapacitate her. Then he tried to handcuff her and he accidentally put both the handcuffs on the same wrist. Also, when he tried to abduct Leslie Parmenter and the brother turned up, he immediately left. So he hates things being taken outside of his control. Now, on the 15th of February, 1976, Bundy is stopped driving a stolen car. So this is, again, it's just a police officer going about their business and Ted Bundy happening to be in a car that's stolen that essentially brings this heinous killer into the spotlight with the police. Now, during the arrest, he kicks the officer's legs from under him and he runs. Now, the officer fires two warning shots and then he pursues him and he tackles him to the ground. So, after he's done this and got Ted Bundy in his control, he goes and looks in the vehicle and the vehicle's got three sets of IDs belonging to female students. He's got 21 stolen credit cards. He's got a stolen television set. And on the way to custody, because obviously this is just music to this officer's ears, whoever this guy is, there is something going on. All of this incriminating evidence needs to be explored. On the way, to the police custody, Bundy actually says to the officer that he wished he had killed him. And he actually says to him, if I run at the jail, will you shoot me then? So now we get to court. June 1979, Bundy stands trial for the murders of Margaret Bowman and Lisa Levy at Chi Amiga Sorority House. Also, he's indicted for three counts of attempted first degree murder for the assaults on Kathy Kleiner, Karen Chandler and Cheryl Thomas and also two counts of burglary. And this crime is tried in a court that for the first time ever is televised in the US. It's televised nationally. 
This is a big deal. You are talking about all different productions coming in to televise it to their networks. It was huge, chaotic, crazy. Everybody wanted a piece of this trial. Bundy, at this point, is still insisting on representing himself to his considerable detriment, of course, because he knows bloody nothing about the legal system in comparison to the prosecutors. You know, it isn't somebody who is going to let him get off easily, is it? So the prosecution are probably thinking that all of their birthdays have come at once because he's just so narcissistic that he thinks somehow he's going to be able to get away with it. But this is typical of narcissistic psychopaths and narcissistic psychopathic serial killers. They have to be in control. They have to be in the spotlight. Can you imagine how much he's loving everybody wanting a piece of him? This is a man who is fast becoming a celebrity. It's just beyond me how anybody can look at these reprehensible human beings and believe that they are interesting, attractive, and anything other than heinous. You know, I mean, we're all interested in what he's done. We're not interested in him. At the end of the day, we know who he is. And he's somebody that, thank God, none of us are ever going to meet. Now, I am so blown away by the fact that even though he was offered a plea deal, so basically he was given the opportunity to agree a 75-year sentence. Just think about that for a moment. Okay, he would never have seen the light of day. He would have always been in prison. But 75-year sentence, he would avoid the death penalty. But he turns it down. This is despite incredibly strong evidence against him. You know, he had eyewitness testimony against him from Nita Neary. There were dental impressions from the bite on Lisa Levy that directly matched his. The belief is, and I think I stand by this as well, he just couldn't face admitting to the world that he'd committed those crimes. It was ultimately more difficult for him to say, the game's up, I'm bang to rights, I absolutely did this, throw the book at me, I'll accept the 75 years and I get my life. It was so difficult for him to drop that superiority that he needed to protest his innocence in spite of the overwhelming evidence against him. He wanted to be the poster boy of an innocent man framed. And his narcissism led him to believe that somehow he could charm people away from the reality of his sins. On the 24th of June, 1979, after less than seven hours deliberation, the jury unanimously found him guilty on all counts. And the judge was like, what kind of sentence shall I give you? I shall give you a death penalty sentence. In fact, forget that, I shall give you two death sentences. We're going to kill you twice. I'm never really sure why they do that. I do get it. They're saying that essentially for those murders, he deserves to be put to death twice, but you can officially only put somebody to death once. So just a death sentence would probably be enough. Six months later, he goes on trial for the abduction and murder of Kimberly Leach. Again, massively strong evidence against him. In fact, an eyewitness literally saw him abducting her. Also, fibres from his jacket were found on the victim. Again, he's found guilty. He gets another death sentence imposed on him. And the judge in this case states this. Your offence was heinous, atrocious and cruel in that it was extremely wicked, shockingly evil, vile and with utter indifference to human life. This is by the way, where the title of Zac Efron's film came from. And can we all just take a minute to say, nobody should cast Zac Efron as Ted Bundy. I mean, Zac Efron is a great actor, I'll give you that, but he's also like a nine out of 10 minimum on the look scale, and Ted Bundy is a three, if that. Why do we put people like Zac Efron as depicting heinous killers like Ted Bundy. Average, lower than average looks wise, not 
Zac Efron. Also, no one should have to watch a film about a horrible serial killer and feel conflicted because it's Zac Efron playing it and you're like, oh, he's really attractive. I don't want to be attracted to this lead guy. This guy's a heinous murderer. I'm just saying, people should definitely care. They didn't do that with Charlize Theron. Charlize Theron is gorgeous. When she played Eileen Wernos, nobody was like, oh, just put her in as Charlize Theron, it won't matter. We always do that with women. We're like, make them put on weight and put prosthetics on their face and make them actually look like the person. Not Zac Efron, he just got to look like Zac Efron playing this heinous human being. Sorry, I digress, it just annoys me. I don't like conflict when I'm watching films like that. Now, bizarrely, you will note from that film as well, there is a scene where he actually proposes to Carol Anne Boone, remember who I talked about earlier on? And this is whilst she's actually giving evidence. So there's this basic obscure state law and it meant that acceptance of a proposal before a judge was legal if she accepted. And she accepted. Again, what does that tell you? He wants that stage, doesn't he? Just complete narcissism. Even when he's meant to be dealing with facing crimes that are just beyond human understanding. He's using it as a playground of possibility to give everyone an opportunity to see him making this proposal to this woman. I mean, it's beyond me. Now, she turns out later down the line to be shocked when he later confessed to the murders. No disrespect to her, but again, how blinkered are you? How blinkered are you? This guy, firstly, his teeth marks were left on a woman's buttocks. They fitted perfectly. Fibres from jackets, eyewitness testimony, his car involved in the crime, his ex actually ringing up and saying, I think it might be my boyfriend. And this woman's like, I'll just marry him anyway. He's totally innocent. How blindsided by attraction are you? It's crazy to me. And she genuinely thought he was innocent. Also, she was hurt by discovery of apparent infidelities, which again is completely unbelievable to me that you're gonna worry about infidelity when this guy has been found guilty of heinous murders. And she actually moved with her daughter to Washington and when he got executed, she didn't take his call. So she was obviously very, very angry stroke, upset by what he did. But like I note, I'm confused as to why anybody would accept a proposal of a man who so clearly is guilty of these crimes. And also, why would you take the word of a man who is clearly a calculating, manipulative psychopath over that of the evidence that was very clear he was guilty? Absolutely. Bundy's need throughout never wavered where it came to being in control. At the end of the day, he was somebody who is a mass manipulator, went out of his way to control every element of his experience. It was something that he desired at all times. And this wasn't just evidenced by the nature of his crimes, it was also evidenced by the way that he acted at court. You know, he rejected his plea deal, he conducted his own defense, and basically, he scuppered his own chances in court by having to be in control of the proceedings. You know, he made this huge theatrical spectacle of himself, loved being in the spotlight, absolutely loved it. Actually, at times, he would wink at the camera and he was also known for talking incoherent nonsense. Then he tried to delay his own execution by basically hinting at more murders but refusing to actually disclose any of the details. The night before his execution, he spoke about suicide because he didn't want to give the state the satisfaction of killing him. And I think that that in itself demonstrates the level of manipulation that he was engaged in from start to finish. He just didn't want anyone having that domination that he so desired throughout all of the crimes. I also do agree with many who have suggested that Bundy did benefit from male white privilege. 
he was treated differently by the authorities because he was white, he was male, he was mostly articulate. And I do think there was a lot of truth in this because if you think about the fact that when you look at his first escape, it occurred, why? Well, it occurred because he was left unshackled in a library with minimum supervision, despite being considered responsible potentially for 30 murders. Would a black man have received this treatment? I highly doubt it. Also, it is quite incredible that he was allowed to swap cells to give him more opportunities to read. A judge actually went, when he complained about the fact that he was struggling to read in his cell, and obviously he's representing himself, that the light wasn't good enough. So the judge went and visited and agreed. And the reason I'm bringing this in is probably based in comments made by the judge who ultimately sentenced him to death. Because remember what you would imagine a judge's summing up would be. And bear in mind, in many of my videos, I talk about the judge's summing up because they give me a sense of peace that this judge is letting the world know just how truly reprehensible this human being is and deserving of what they're about to experience, right? That brings me peace. But the judge who ultimately sentenced him to death referred to him as a bright young man. In fact, he said he wished to take in a different path so that he could have practiced law in front of him. Like, bear in mind, this was said to a man who, in truth, was completely unable to even grasp the basic concepts of legal education and actually dropped off the law course. In fact, the judge even stated that he held no animosity towards him. I have no animosity towards you. I don't feel any anger towards you. Even Ted Bundy must have been like, I mean, you hold no animosity towards Ted Bundy? A 60 year old who knows nothing about life would show animosity towards this human being if I gave them a brief pricey about what they did. This is the man who claimed the lives of so many innocent victims in the most brutal ways imaginable, but you don't have no animosity towards him. And if that isn't enough to add insult to injury, the judge stated this, quote, take care of yourself, young man. It's a tragedy for this court to see such a total waste of humanity. You're a bright young man. You'd have made a good lawyer. I would have loved to have had you practice in front of me, but you went another way, partner. No words, no words. But I do think somehow that that judge was maybe making his judgments based on his perception and bias of class and race potentially just throwing it out there because it's not the way you'd expect the case to go when it comes down to a summing up is it undoubtedly Bundy went under the authorities radar because he appeared on the surface to be like one of them yet when you look at the statistics on serial killers in the USA more than 80% of them are male Caucasian and in their 20s or 30s so male and white and pretty young so that's who they should be looking at when they're thinking about serial killers. Following the trials, Bundy actually did begin to confess to more crimes. This is in interviews. But when he speaks and spoke in those interviews, he would refer to himself in the third person. It could be an attempt to disassociate himself from the guilt. And the people who actually spoke to him about this, they indicated that he was literally obsessed with murder all the time. And when he recounted the details, when he reflected on the crimes, they said it was like he was reliving it. It's like he was there. Also, it's worth noting that people who interviewed him said that he had obvious misogyny. In fact, they said he had this intense hatred and rage against women. 
And I think that going back to the very beginning, there is a potential link, isn't there? It could come from his mother withholding the parentage issue. It could come from his grandmother lying to him. It could come from his idea and identity about what makes a perfect stereotypical mother and how they, in his mind, fell short. Who knows? It could be that growing up, he realised there was something very, very wrong with him. And he blamed his mother's actions, not having a father that was actually legitimate to him, creating and cultivating this negative feeling within him. Who knows? He could have been looking to displace the blame. But certainly people responded to the fact that he was somebody who came across as a person who disliked women. And certainly from his actions, that is very, very clear. July 1984. Guess what? Bundy's up to his old tricks again. The guards managed to discover two hacksaw blades in his cell. And he'd actually managed to completely saw through the top and bottom of a window bar. And he'd glued it back in place with adhesive made from soap. What is going on in prisons at this point with serial killers who are very, very dangerous and they're just managing to create these scenarios where they might escape? I mean, he is a prolific, prolific individual criminally, isn't he? October 1984, he actually does what amuses me, if I'm honest, because he offers his assistance in hunting the Green River Killer. He's like, I know who you need for this job. You need a serial killer. That's who you need for a job like this. And guess what? I'm a serial killer and I can do a job like this because I've been a serial killer. So he gets involved. Bear in mind, when they let him get involved with this, they just want to kind of tease out any more killings he's got involved and not really taking it seriously. But he suggests that the killer might be going back to the sites where he left the bodies. He says that he'll be, they'll be performing sexual acts on the bodies. And he suggests that the detectives stake out fresh burial sites. And, you know, whilst it's a great story to tell, the truth is that Bundy really didn't help out that much. Gary Ridgway was the killer and he wasn't actually apprehended for another 17 years. And, it, you know, Ted Bundy did get a few points correct because he did return to the bodies, he did have sex with the bodies afterwards. But the reality is these seem like more educated guesses and much of the advice that he gave the investigators were just ignored. On the 24th of January, 1989, Ted Bundy is finally executed. His last words were, Jim and Fred, I'd like you to give my love to all my family and friends. Now, he was referring in that moment to his attorneys, Jim Coleman and Methodist minister, Fred Lawrence. Because you know how it is. They always find God, don't they, at the end? Just find God at the end. Because, you know, I don't want to not go to heaven. I don't think God's going to let you into heaven. I think there's a whole area of hell and that you'll probably have a neighbour like Hitler but you will probably be able to bump into a fair few serial killers that you might have helped profile at some point. But to some degree, it clearly shows that he wasn't apologising for anything in those last moments. Because he could have, couldn't he? The last words that he could have spoken could have been to apologise. The last words that he could have said could have allowed the families of those that he brutalised to understand that he really took responsibility and accountability for it. But he didn't do that. He was just thinking about himself. And I don't really think his family and friends would have cared at all about him saying goodbye to them in that way. I'm sure that they too would have hoped that he would have shown at least a little bit of humility and acceptance in his death. After his death, lots and lots of young women, they were dismayed, they were grief-stricken, they were convinced that they were going to meet him and be the only one for him. They wanted relationships with this guy. Now, this is a phenomena known as hybristophilia, and this is basically the sexual interest and attraction to those who commit crimes. It said that some women were so broken by his death that they literally had breakdowns. Yeah, Bundy somehow, ironically, managed to damage and deceive women even after death. With regard to Bundy's pathology, 
he was diagnosed with different conditions by varying experts and obviously a lot of experts were genuinely very very interested in Ted Bundy. They diagnosed him with various classifications from bipolar even to disassociative identity disorder but the most level agreement was on a form of antisocial personality disorder and I think we can all agree he was definitely a psychopath but if we want any more evidence he scored 39 out of 40 on the hair psychopathy checklist. There was also a possible alternative diagnosis of narcissistic personality disorder. Can we just throw them in together? Let's just call him both because he definitely was, wasn't he? I mean, I don't think any of us are going to split hairs over that one, are we? He is, though, when I think about this case and what I've covered and even my own understanding of it now as I've gone through it in a real deep dive, I'm so annoyed by the way he is portrayed. He is portrayed in films as this ultra-confident, smooth-talking man who's able to charm literally anyone at will. And it's not true. This was a man who was deeply insecure. He believed himself as inadequate. When he was stressed, actually, he found it very difficult to communicate. It, he was known for sounding almost incoherent. Also, ladies, I know none of you watching find Ted Bundy hot, but if any of you ever gravitated to that, I want you to know this. He was a habitual nose picker. He's also a chronic nail biter. So not the cool, suave poster boy that he's often depicted as. And I think that he's a paradox in many ways, isn't he? Because whilst he claimed not to really understand social behaviour, he did seem to mimic it perfectly. You know, his ability to recognise how people should behave is what made him so dangerous. When you think about a wolf in sheep's clothing, he has to be the ultimate one. He didn't just go under the radar. He was able to completely fool people. He fitted in perfectly to some degree with society. He was the inmate, so to speak, running the asylum, but running it really well. I mean, when he talked about high school, he even claimed that he didn't understand the concept of friendship. He stated, I didn't know what made people want to be friends. I didn't know what underlay social interactions. Yet, he was a really popular student. So was he mimicking this? It was also a paradox to police. He had no adult convictions. He was a law student. Obviously, that helped him evade capture. And even though several people had actually given the police his name in 1974, they still didn't figure that he could be the person responsible. So despite the fact this guy is a psychopathic killer, he was also ironically able to display or mimic empathy. And I'll tell you why, because Anne Rule, well, she worked with him on a suicide prevention hotline. She described him as kind, solicitous, and empathetic. So he mimicked empathy and he exploited it. You know, that's how he managed to get people to be victims. He pretended to be injured to lure the victims into his car. Also, really interesting that he could maintain relationships with women whilst also in parallel callously killing them. I mean, Elizabeth Klopfer was a long-term girlfriend. In the six years that she was with Bundy, they lived as a family. He helped to bring up her daughter, Molly. However, this isn't the only relationship he had. You know, he dated many other women as well. 1973, remember, he rekindled his relationship with Diane Edwards on the trip to California. In 1974, he was dating Carol Ann Boone. In August 1974, when he moved to Salt Lake City to study law, he dated at least a dozen other women. So he could control those murderous impulses when he wanted to. So it's like he would keep women close to him when he felt that he was entering the predator mode. So he knew he was gonna harm other women, yet he needed to retain the intimacy and closeness of individuals he wasn't going to kill. Almost like proving to himself that he was really that jackal and hide or 
confirming that whilst he was this notorious evil killer, he was also capable of warmth. Maybe he himself struggled with that juxtaposition. Now, before the rampage actually began in the mid-1970s, it's also worth noting that he was genuinely on the verge of a really quite promising political career. Highly thought of by the people that he worked with. Remember, he had, at this point, the woman of his dreams. He enrolled on a law course, but he threw it all away. You know, did he? And I guess this is an interesting question to pose. Did he consciously decide that he wanted to follow the serial killer path full time instead? Was that it? Was that those desires and the belief that he could get away with continuing fulfilling those desires, did they take over to the point where he was willing to disregard everything that he was trying to achieve to just commit? It's clear that he was living a double life for some time, that Jacqueline Hyde lifestyle, like I've said. So what was it that meant that he didn't continue? Why did he give things up? He was a really highly organized killer. I mean, he was good at it for a long time, but you can see, can't you? There were contrasts. Think about his early plan kills and then how that descending into those frenzied, opportunistic kills whilst he was on the run. Also, whilst he was just highly organized and careful, it feels like there was also this brazenly careless side to himself. And that could be, of course, the fact that he was very superior, very narcissistic, thought he could get away with everything. It could be there's another side to his nature where there is a level of mental decline at times. You know, he did abduct women in public places. So was that about feeling so powerful that he wanted to push himself more and more to say to himself, I can get away with anything, look at me. I'm abducting women in public places. You know, he returned on one occasion to a really busy crime scene to actually collect the belongings of a victim. He worked in rape prevention. He worked on missing women's cases whilst raping and abducting women. You know, he drove a distinctive car. Sometimes he didn't even have his license plate on. He had his passenger side front seat removed. He had a kill kit in the boot. This all attracted attention. And you'd imagine that that would make him more sophisticated, make him play things down, but it didn't. It's like, the more he got away with these crimes, the more he became avert with them to some degree, the more confident those abductions in broad daylight, even using his real name when he was stalking his victims, you know, his arm in a sling, his leg in a cast, and yet he's driving the same car, easily could have been seen, couldn't he? Easily could have been noted, because you're gonna notice things like that. Ted Bundy must have known that there was a likelihood the police were given information, and some of that information would be, oh, there was a guy who's acting like he's got a broken arm or left. They hadn't actually divulged that to the public during his crimes, they didn't want to scupper chances of the investigation, but he would have known. He would have been absolutely aware that there was a likelihood these details were known to the police. So maybe there's a part of Ted Bundy that was just certain that the authorities actually weren't that competent. They didn't have the interstate cooperation. They didn't have the ability to join the dots and that's why he was so overt. And I guess the final paradox is displayed in the interviews before his death. Because he disclosed details of other murders, but when the authorities checked, they found absolutely nothing. So there was this apparent conflict, I guess, between wanting to delay the execution whilst not actually wanting to disclose the resting places of his victims. It's like only he was allowed to know. Again, a paradox. Often it's said of Bundy that he used his appearance to his advantage, you know, he charmed women. But did he really? Because again, that seems to be something that people believe, but when I've reflected and researched, I don't agree. Because when you look at the actual crimes, he either attacked them in their sleep or 
He appealed to their altruistic and compassionate side by feigning an injury. He didn't charm them. It wasn't his irresistible allure. It was the fact that he looked injured or they weren't conscious. I will give you the fact that one of the things that makes him stand out is the fact that he had quite generic features that arguably he could change a lot. So he could use that to his advantage, I guess. It meant that he could change his features. You know, if he grew facial hair, if he changed his hairstyle, there is something very generic about his look that makes him able to fit in and be chameleon-like, even though he has the same face. And you'll see that from his mug shots. It's as simple as that. Now, the true reason for Bundy's reign of terror is something that he took to the grave. You know, he always wanted to stay in control, so he gave differing interviews about differing reasons whilst he was on death row. And that's because he liked talking about it, you know? He probably really got some sexual stimulation from reliving what he did and having you listen. That's always the fine line when you interview somebody like this, that how much are they enjoying reliving it, reflecting? And how much are we disrespecting the victim to some degree when we allow them to do that? Because they take great pride in what they do. And the fact that he shifted his story a lot suggests he was certainly in control of those scenarios and in control of the interviewers, even when they didn't believe that he was. Now, shortly before his execution, you can watch this online, I've watched all of them. He does claim in an interview that pornography and that true crime magazines had triggered his murderous behavior. However, the interview that he gave was also with a very long-term critic of pornography. And so it's been suggested that this was a further attempt at manipulation, so a way of shifting the blame, because in other interviews he did actually say that pornography had no effect and that he never actually read true crime magazines. I personally don't believe that. I've done quite a lot of research, I've read some interviews, I've listened to some, and I get the feeling that he definitely was into hardcore pornography and the way that he describes tripping over from fantasy to reality, it feels very real. And we know that trauma can certainly be, shall we say, a tick box in the activation of potential when it comes down to psychopathic serial killers. Trauma is important. And he had trauma being brought up in a family that lied to him. And he also was exposed to trauma as far as graphic in hardcore porn. That does, to me, feel like it fits effectively. You make your own minds up. And certainly when he described about posing the bodies in crime scene manipulation, I again would be unsurprised if that were the case. But again, if you want to manipulate somebody that you're talking to, give them what they want. And the interviewer that was a longtime critic of pornography certainly was given that, you know, he will have very happily tagged onto the idea that Ted Bundy had murdered these innocent women because of porn. That noted, I also think it's really important to recognize that there are forms of pornography that I think are really bloody bad for us. And certainly when you work with young men who can't get erections unless they're watching pornography, a woman being simulated in a rape scene, we have a problem, right? We do need to think about social responsibility and it's not okay to just say all porn's okay. It's not and it certainly has an impact. And we should certainly be thinking about that impact, particularly on prepubescent kids who have got access to smartphones and can find the most heinous information out there and can see in 360 vision things that we shouldn't want our children ever seeing. Bundy never actually accepted responsibility, by the way, for any of his crimes. This is despite his confessions. He always pointed the blame elsewhere. So it was never his fault. It was society's fault. He also accused the police of planting evidence. What, like your teeth marks? How did they do that? And he blamed TV for brainwashing him. He blamed pornography for turning him. He even blamed victims. Yeah, he blamed victims. So in his letter to Klopfer, he said, their facial expressions say, I am afraid of you. These people invite abuse by expecting to be hurt. Do they subtly encourage it? 
Sorry? Should we go through that again? Their facial expressions say, I am afraid of you. These people invite abuse by expecting to be hurt. Do they subtly encourage it? What, like a girl wearing a short skirt who's subtly encouraging you violating and raping them? Like a guy who's drinking a pint at a pub who's subtly inviting you glassing him? Like a pedestrian crossing a zebra crossing who's subtly encouraging you to knock them down and run over them? I mean, this sums up Ted Bundy. It's not my fault. It's their fault. If only they hadn't looked scared of me with my crowbar, I wouldn't have had to hit them with my crowbar. Thus is the psychology of certain psychopathic individuals. He also could never understand why people were out to get him. Why are they out to get me? I don't understand it. I'm, so, I'm a nice guy. If those victims hadn't had fearful expressions over my face, I would never have had to kill them. It's not fair that I'm in prison. They should just let me go out and carry on killing people who subtly are inviting being wanted to be killed. So he never comprehended the enormity of the crimes. He killed girls, but you know, so what? You know, there's a lot of them around. One could also argue that he was trying to minimise his actions. He was trying to avoid his guilt. You know, maybe he was dealing with the overwhelming reality of his crimes and couldn't handle it. I doubt that very much, but nonetheless, we'll throw that in as a possibility. But one of the things that he actually did express is that he didn't experience guilt. He said this, I am in the enviable position of not having to feel any guilt. And that's it. Guilt is the mechanism we use to control people. It's an illusion. It's this kind of social control mechanism and it's very unhealthy. I know I've done this a few times, I've just got to go through this again with you. I am in the enviable position of not having to feel any guilt. And that's it. Guilt is the mechanism we use to control people. It's an illusion. It's the kind of social control mechanism and it's very unhealthy. That is so wrong. I cannot even describe it. So I appreciate that these days we talk a lot about social constructs, don't we? There's a social construct for it. It's not real, it's just a social construct. It's just a social construct. It's like, no, it's not a social construct, right? That would be like saying that a child who feels horrific fear when they are sexually molested by a parent and don't understand the sexual experience but feel it's wrong that somehow that's just a social construct as opposed to an innate emotional response to something reprehensible happening you don't need a social construct to know how something feels Right, so as a child, when you're growing up, you don't have the social constructs that adults have because we've conditioned ourselves and been conditioned by the society around us. You just have intrinsic feelings. When you take something that belongs to someone else, very few children have been told it's wrong. You just know. You just know. The same as if you hurt somebody even though nobody might have seen it, you just know it's wrong. It's in you. It's an innate conscience and consciousness. It's been here since human beings became the individuals that we grew into when our brains developed conscience and understanding of that conscience. Guilt is conscience. What he's saying there is that he has no conscience. It's not an illusion. It's absolutely not. We may build our societies around our morals and our laws that reflect those morals, but those morals came from an innate knowledge of what is right and what is wrong. We are hardwired with certain emotional experiences. It's the same with pain to some degree. You don't really need to put your hand into a fire to know it will burn you. 
It's just within you. You don't need society to say, don't do that, you'll get burned. You just know. And guilt and conscience, you just know. It's an internal moderator. And it wouldn't matter whether the law told you it was right or wrong. You know it. You know it. It's something within us. And Ted Bundy just doesn't have it. He just saw murder as being a part of who he was. And part of his relationship with women was that he never really had relationships with them. They were just objects for him. He objectified them. And this is clearly illustrated when he said this. Women are possessions. Beings which are subservient more often than not to males. Women are merchandise. Yeah, he really said that. And this is a guy that women have breakdowns over after he was put to death. Listen, we're never gonna know the reason for his crimes fully, but we can be sure of one thing. It's his victims that deserve remembering, not him. You know how I feel about the death sentence. I'm not somebody who enjoys knowing that people are put to death, but my God, the world is a better place without him. Thank God his last date was with old Sparky, otherwise known as Florida State's prison's electric chair in Rayford. It's just a shame it didn't happen sooner in my regard. And I know that's not like me, but after learning and really deep diving into this case, I have no doubt whatsoever that this human predator lived to see others die. Every single one of those children and women who were brutally murdered, they have not had their opportunity to tell their own story because he stole it from them. They haven't gone on to get married, have children, live their lives fully, change our society for the better because this man had these warped desires and saw them as merchandise something to be procured, abused, thrown away, all for his benefit. Ted Bundy is one of the most reprehensible, terrifying, distorted excuses for a man that has ever walked this earth. And I know I didn't go into the great detail about what happened to each of his victims, but I don't feel we need to. I've told you what happened, when it happened, and how they met their doom without going into the gore of it because this man already took so much from the individuals that were murdered. I don't want to add to that by going into the depraved details of what was played out. All we need to know is that every single one of those girls, every single one of those women deserved a much better outcome. And it's also imagining those survivors of Ted Bundy and how their lives have played out since and just hoping that they have gone on to live happy, healthy, successful lives, lives that they absolutely fully deserved. It's really worth listening to the interviews, watching as much detail as you can about him, because this guy, like I said, he was a chameleon. He was a liar from the moment he was born to the moment that he died. The fact that he was putting knives around his aunt's body at three years of age, setting fire to cats, injuring and harming children from an early age, really. We don't know the extent of his murders, but we imagine there are many, many more than those reported. I hope you found this intriguing, interesting. I hope you've learned something about this. I think we all agree this was a psychopathic serial killer of the highest degree. And without doubt, as I note before, would this have played out the way it played out if he hadn't been a white middle-class man who managed to mimic so effectively successful traits that others of us revere? And I think the answer is no. What we do know is Ted Bundy got killed by electric chair and fortunately will likely still be smoking wherever he is in hell. I imagine it's very, very hot down there. Thanks for joining me. You asked for this one. Wow, I think it's been a long one, but it's a big case. And obviously I've missed out lots of different things because I'd be here till next Wednesday. But I hope that I've illuminated this a little bit more. I hope that you feel the level of disdain that you should for this man. I hope I have de-glamorized the reality of this 
paedophile, necrophile, murderous conman and taken him down from the position of Hollywood serial killer icon because he needs to be brought down as fast as possible and he needs to be buried deep in the annals of time so that we no longer give oxygen to this kind of human being. Take care, see you again soon. Join me next time for True Crime with me, Emma Kenny, and let me know your thoughts. If you've enjoyed this content, at least finding out more about these cases, please subscribe. And like I said, if you've not joined me for a live, I'm doing them on a Wednesday and a Sunday. I'll see you then, take care. And as ever, this is my 100th episode. Thank you for making it possible. You guys are incredible. I hope I've done you proud. Take care.